So now that we've talked about the overall structure of the quote services application, and we zoomed in on the Eureka discovery service portion, let's now talk about another key part, which is going to be this API gateway concept. And before we talk about how we do it in detail with Spring and, and our example, let's first discuss the API gateway pattern, because it really is a pattern that gets applied in many different places. So we're going to talk about the API gateway pattern and a common realization of this pattern, which will be the Spring Cloud Gateway. So what is the API gateway pattern? It's a pattern that provides a single entry point for backend APIs and their realizations or implementations in the form of microservices. If you, if you don't have microservices, the need for an API gateway is minimized. If you're using a monolithic server style application, probably don't necessarily need an API gateway, but you might, but that's less relevant. So we're looking at this for microservices. So you can see here, here's the overall architecture. We've got client apps, which could be mobile apps, which could be web apps. We've got a bunch of backend microservices. We've got the API gateway, which kind of sits between the client and the backend microservices. And there can only be one of these API gateways. And it's, it's the gateway, it's the entry point into the backend capabilities. So what's the purpose of this? Why do we do this? We want to be able to provide a unified experience for users. And the gateway, as you can see here with this other diagram, exposes a single API to clients. Now that API may have a lot of methods in it, but it only exposes um, one entry point, usually at a well-defined port number like 8080. And there's other reasons for doing that as well. This, by the way, what we're about to talk about is in the context of the Spring Cloud Gateway or Spring Cloud API Gateway. There are other gateways out there too. This is the one we're using for Spring. They all behave more or less the same way. So here's what it does. It takes all client API requests. So no matter how many clients there are, no matter what they're trying to do, they all communicate to the overall application and the backend microservices through the one and only API gateway. The API gateway takes a look at the incoming requests, the, the incoming HTTP request, and it cracks it open and looks at various pieces of it, and it checks to see whether there are any microservices it knows about through discovery and other forms of routing and, and searching that it can then take the request, crack the request open, extract out the relevant parts, and then forward them on, forward the request on after appropriate modifications to the designated microservice. So it figures that out. So that's kind of what's going on here with this routing gateway handler one, routing gateway handler two, routing gateway handler three, blah, 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 blah. And you'll see in a minute when we get into more of the details that there's these concepts of predicates and filters to do this. And then once it figures this out, it goes ahead and forwards the request or routes the request to the appropriate microservice or microservices, depending on what's happening. Now, the microservices that it's forwarding to can either be internal to the system, ones that the developers of the system built themselves, or they could be external. They could be things that are third-party services. So you could have stuff that comes from elsewhere. And that's one of the beauties of using this gateway that the clients don't really know or care where the microservices are coming from. So that gives you extra degrees of flexibility and extra degrees of being able to do orchestration and reuse and taking, leveraging third-party components that you didn't develop but are useful for building your application. So let's talk a bit about the pros and cons of using the API gateway pattern before we get too much into the details of how it works, especially in the context of our example. So of course, there's some benefits, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about this. And one of the benefits is it simplifies client interaction. Clients only have to know about one point of entry. So you've got all these internal clients, they can access a bunch of services, but they only have to know about one entry point into that. And in particular, there's only one service API that's needed to access everything that's exposed here. And one of the cool things we're going to see later about how we do this with Spring is that it's actually very, very simple to program the gateway because you don't write any code or you write almost no code. You basically write declaration files in YAML. Another benefit you get here is this can be used to improve microservice security. How does it do that? Well, what you do is you only expose one port number, the port number of the API gateway. And that can then internal to the API gateway in the so-called secure private zone, 
it knows how to contact the other ports on the other services. However, those ports are not exposed. Those things are not visible. So one of the nice things about that is the clients don't need to know and can't know the internal system architecture. That's all completely invisible to them. The fact that you've got other services running here, listening on other ports, they don't know that. They only know about port 8080, or whatever you choose to make your public port, and all the other ports just become an implementation detail. And the clients can't figure out how to access those ports. So that gives you greater degree of control over, your, for, over the surface area that people could use to attack your system. Now, it also means you've got to be paying a lot of attention to your, your gateway, and you have to make sure it works properly. But this cuts down on the amount of things you have to be concerned with. Along those lines, one of the other cool things about using an API gateway is that cross-cutting concerns only need to be implemented once in the API gateway since everything gets routed through it. So things like authentication, monitoring and metric collection, load balancing, failover, resiliency, all these kinds of things, those don't need to be done all over the place. You can just centralize them in one place, again, making it easier to control the surface area of attacks. And we all know that websites are prone to lots of attacks because in the words of Willie Sutton, you know, they asked Willie Sutton, he was a bank robber, they said, Willie, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. So why do we attack public gateways? Because that's the access to the valuable information and content we want, the bad guys want. Now, of course, as always, not everything is rainbows and unicorns. As I like to say, there are some downsides to using an API gateway. So one of the, the things that are, you have to be upfront about is there's more moving parts, right? There's a lot more pieces you have to be concerned with. If you only have a monolithic application where everything's in one address space, that's the one and only place you have to worry about. You have to learn that one thing. You have to put that one thing. You deploy that one thing. You orchestrate that one thing. It's, it's easy peasy. So having more pieces means there's more moving parts and there's a learning curve associated with coming up to speed with that. In particular, you're gonna to have to be able to do more complicated and more sophisticated deployment and orchestration mechanisms to get all those microservices to run. And that of course motivates other things that are a bit outside the scope of this class, like containers that do uh, orchestration like Docker or Kubernetes and so on. Those are the focus of other classes you can take here, such as the cloud computing class. But be aware that a production system would have to use those kinds of things. The other issue here, of course, is extra levels of indirection caused by this extra hop can slow things down. So if you go through multiple hops, there is some cost, <coughs> excuse me, some performance overhead incurred by that. Usually not very much in the grand scheme of things relative to the network latencies, but it is something to think about. And Everything's relative to something else. So the other approach would be to have the clients have a direct client to microservice model where each client knows all the microservices and contacts them directly. So in this case, each microservice has a public endpoint with a different TCP port, possibly a different host address and so on. This approach is doable, but it doesn't really scale and it's really only viable for very simple or small deployments with just a handful of microservices. You're usually much better off by having an API gateway and then having it manage all the coordination and orchestration and routing and security and load balancing and failover, blah, 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 uh, rather than you having to try to manage that yourself. So that's the end of the overview of the API gateway pattern. Next, of course, we're gonna talk about how this is realized in the context of Spring and in our example application.